I've thought about it three times now. You help me, help me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally me, me procrastinating. <laughs> um, how many how many interviews for Scott Lee's Little Soldiers have you done? Oh, pull loads. Mic, pull that mic in. Oh. Pull that mic in, young lady. Not one with a <laughs> mic. <laughs> Normally I'm told to not be right near the mic. Uh, loads. Been 10 years now we've been doing the charity. What? Um, what? Still get nervous. What? Uh, get nervous doing interviews? Yeah. Or Why? I don't know. My brother's like, it's your life. How can you get it wrong? Uh, why are you nervous about getting things wrong? I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's it's these days, I, I think there's a lot, maybe there's, it, it seems a lot easier to say the wrong thing. That wasn't the wrong thing 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, and then you get absolutely hammered for it. You've got to be a lot more careful, haven't you? Yeah. I think. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm fine. So I'm just looking at myself. <laughs> um, it's understandable. I'm, but is, what, is the stuff you've been doing live then? Yeah, so, mixture. Yeah, mix. TV's worse when you've got a camera in your face. And you're like, oh. mm. but, but I know how important this sort of stuff is and the difference it makes to getting the word out there and getting more people behind the charity. And so I do it because it's, Im- it's important. And I, I try and be as open and honest as I can be. So I'm not worried about you asking any serious questions or... Um, upsetting questions because it's important people know mm-hmm. the story behind the charity as well why it's set up and what it does so go on then why okay. is it set up and it <laughs> while you're while you're when you're talking i'm just going to move this cam- that other camera but go on okay so um we were to- yeah we were talking off air your your husband was world tank measurement wasn't he mm-hmm. right take it from the top nikki you start where you want to start yeah so um when um so lee was second world tank regiment and he, we got married in February 2008. I'd, I'd, I'd been with him quite a while, knowing him for like a few years. But um, when I first met Lee, he was a, a proper, he was either drunk or hungover. This is before he was in the army. And um, I remember saying to my mate who I worked with in a pub, oh, will you tell your mate to shut up? Because he keeps asking me out and he's like, I'm never in a million years ever going to even go on a date with him. And then ended up marrying him. Can you believe that? Like, when I think <laughs> back to it now, I'm like, what? But yeah, we got married in 2008 and th- in February. And that's when I moved to Tidworth in the garrison. And I really began to see army life and the community and, you know, made some amazing mates that even now, you know, don't have to speak to him every day. But that I know they're there and they're just, there's that bond. Same that the lads have. I think the women have it, the girl, the wives. And um so that was 2008 and fell pregnant with Brooke as well. So we already had Kai, who was five, um, and got married, moved there because Kai was about to start school. So wanted to be settled. Um, yeah, and then had Brooke and then had Brooke in the November and then Lee went on tour in the June. And then it all obviously went wrong and fell apart. So he went on the 2nd of June. It was just his squadron, so it wasn't the whole regiment. Um, and... It was it was a it was my first tour where I was in a garrison, and um, it's just hard to get. I didn't even think where he was going. I was quite a naive army wife when I look back now. I think I didn't even really think about what was going on in Afghanistan or what he was doing. I was just thinking about oh god, like six months of being a single mum, like so selfish. <laughs> just like and. Um, and my mates, I had a couple of mates and their husbands were in the same squadron. So we just kept really close together and we'd sort of see each other. And this, this, you know, one day I'd been like 10th of July and um, I'd been on a walk with my friend Laura and our little ones. And I had to go back to the house to get the car to go and get Kai from school. And that's, and it was my day to be fed up. I was like, I've not heard from Lee for five days. Like, I feel really crap like I was just like oh, I can't couldn't sleep last night and Laura was just saying the same as we all used to say like you're you'll hear from him later and like we're always you know there's always one of us that's low it's fine you'll be cool like li- hear him he'll ring later and then it'll all be good again and then literally as I said goodbye and I pushed Brooke up in the buggy to my house there were two cars that went past and there was a man in each and I literally remember just thinking they're they're going to my house it was so bizarre that I just was like I didn't I don't normally I wouldn't even notice you know the cars and I as I walked down my cul-de-sac I I cried already because I just knew and I I was but I was saying 
oh my god, Lee's been hurt. Lee's been hurt. Oh my god, Lee's Be- been before hurt. Before the cars had got there. Yeah, they they just driven past me and gone to my cul de sac, and it was like oh, it was like a little um, lane of houses. It was about five houses. Mine was second from the end, and they'd pulled up outside. And I knew the lady next door, her husband was on tour with a different regiment. Um, so in the back of your head, you're kind of like, well, it could be Eve. But it was just bizarre. Just like, you know, we well, probably don't know. But for, as a wife, you like that whole tour. I mean, Lee had only been away six weeks. He wasn't even really long into his tour. But I just had that. Um, I went from thinking, not really worrying about where he was and just thinking, oh, God, he's away. And then the week before Lee was killed, um, a trooper, Josh Hammond, was killed. And I got a phone call from the welfare to say Lee had been involved in an incident but was okay, but there was a fatality. And and um, that's when I suddenly was like, oh, God, like, he's, this is real now. And that is when I suddenly, that last week was just like, this is not... This is not good. And then I also was thinking, well, he's had a close call. So, a li- like, it sounds as horrible as it was. It was almost like that relief. Okay, it won't be Lee now because he's obviously had his big incident. It's just weird how your mind works, isn't it? And and that night when I spoke to Lee after Josh had died, he he was completely different. Like, he he he's always... He would never tell me about tours and stuff. He wouldn't ever want to... He'd always just be like, oh, yes, it's fuck, it's cool, it's fine. Like, how's the kids? He didn't really go into it. And then that time after Josh died, he literally was saying things that I don't even realise he knew he was saying to me. So he's like, oh, we're all right now. We've, we've, washed, we've washed all the blood off in, this, in, the, in the water. And, like, it was just coming out with stuff. And I was just like, wow, like, what? You'd never normally tell me this. And then he said to me, I'm going to sign off as soon as we're back at camp. So think about where you want to go. Start planning what you want to do. And I was saying, Lee, it's just the shock. Like, you've, you know, you've just lost Josh. You'd be like, don't worry about it. Like, I will support whatever you want to do if that's your decision. But don't don't make it now. Like, you know, to, let's just take one day at a time. And it was a really weird phone call. And then and it left me feeling a bit. I, I knew the next day I spoke to Lee and it, I was right that he'd be fine again. And it was all like, yep. And boosting the lads, we're back out here, we're doing this for Josh. This is like, but he'd said to me, This is like scenes of World War II. Like, I've never done any tour like this. He said, The other tours were just like playing compared to this. This is, I don't want to be, do-. and that's what sticks with me because Lee would never have said that. So, from that, from Josh dying that last week, I knew it was bad and then I went then there was a death every day so the lines of communication were down so five days after that call like I never spoke to him again ah uh, sort of five days because of um up minimize yeah that's the right term see I don't know all these army terms all right just trying to think about it there yeah no up, up minimize yeah it's me okay because yeah. I think he was killed in one of the worst weeks there were eight that come back on his repatriation who, do you, can you remember who his tank unit were attached to? No, it was Op 10. The Herrick squadron, 10. sorry, the tank unit. Sorry, sorry, uh, tankies. <laughs> who his squadron was attached to? No, to be honest. Um, Herrick 10, it was Herrick 10, it was 2009. Yep. Well, it wasn't the boot next, was it? I don't know. And anyway. I, I don't know. know. Anyway. But the, um, annoyingly, because I've met quite a few guys that were out there as well. As the time's gone on and I've done the charity, I've met people that were out there and at the same time and... Like it's quite interesting that I've I've managed to I can talk more about it, but I've managed to meet um basically Lee's journey back home. I, I knew the guys that put him on the helicopter. I'm I, I spoke to the nurse that was in the hospital that dealt through another friend. She got in touch, didn't know whether she she took ages because she wasn't sure whether I'd want to speak to her or not. That was out in Kambas in Afghan, yeah, in Kambastian. Then I knew I obviously knew the lads that put him onto the helicopter um onto the plane to bring him home. And then I knew the guys from the tank regiment that bought him off the plane at repatriation at Wooten Bassett. And then I met the guy that led the cars, the police officer that led the cars all the way to Oxford. And then I knew, I know the funeral directors that, that had Lee in Norfolk. So the only part of the Lee's journey from Afghan where I didn't know someone with him was from Oxford to Kings Lynn, which is mad, isn't it? Mm. Like, it means a lot because it, you know, you know, someone, that's the worst bit, not being out there with him and stuff. But I've jumped, sorry. No, 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 it's <laughs> fine, it's fine. So you, you're saying you, you from right from the start, you knew the medic who put him on the chopper, you'd say that? 
No, not the medics. So I knew the guys that were there, obviously. Um, but I met the I met a nurse that was in the hospital. So when he got back into camp, Bastion, I yeah, spoke to the nurse that worked in the hospital with him. How? Uh, uh, what was that? How, what did that do for you? Do meet those people, especially the nurse and people like that. How? How did that? Did it, was that by choice? He did that. Yeah, she got in touch with me. I don't know whether I'm meant to. Same with like like there's stuff like that. I had the whole. Uh, Lee's troop around my house when they got back the day after they got back and they weren't meant to come into my home but apparently that well I think the MOD like to make sure you know I've got my visiting officer and it's not fair on the lads and like to but the troop sergeant was like yeah we'll do anything you want to do Nikki so ask whatever you want to ask and the lads were amazing because I just asked some random questions about Ran, you know, like what way out was Lee facing? Who found Lee? Like proper. You wanted, you wanted to know what happened. I wanted to know everything. Yeah, not just what I was being told. I wanted to hear from the boys that were there. Do yeah. You, do you mind talking about it? No, I've never spoke about that bit actually. It's interesting, isn't it? Because when you do <laughs> interviews and stuff, you always speak about, you know, the funeral a little bit and stuff. And I can switch off now because it's been ten years. You're seeing my eyes are going now because it's new, new, new zone. We're moving mine, into. Mine will, mine will start going. <laughs> Um, but it's, I, like I said, it's important people know this stuff because this is what all the families have been through, you know. It, again, so. uh, it's up to you though. Uh, the only reason I ask that is because, and um, is because, um, like, as you know now, and I know that there, there is some things that people would feel really awkward asking someone who's bereaved about or to talk about, but actually sometimes mm-hmm. the person wants to talk about it and they want to be asked. Yeah, uh, in, in Tash, abs- and and it can be misconstrued sometimes. As um, I, it just can be misconstrued sometimes, but it's not. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Uh, talk. Yeah. Talking and helps, I, right? Yeah, it does. And and I've learned, you know, I've met l- so many bereaved families now, and widows and widowers, and and everyone is different, and everyone grieves different. But for me personally, I want. I felt like I felt crap as a wife because I wasn't by his side so I wanted to know everything that I could possibly know and I also didn't want to read something in a book and it'd be different to what I'd been told and you know I wanted to make sure you know because you can receive a letter from I don't know the RSM or something you know and I'm like but you weren't out there you you were you were only writing what you've been told I want to know the person that was there with Lee what had happened and it really helped me because I knew I knew the truth. Nothing could shock me then. Um, yeah, and I, I just felt close to them, to, to the guy. When they were in my lounge, they must have been. Oh, I know some of them now. And they were like, it's the, that was the hardest thing. With, I was so nervous. And um, it was just me. There wasn't like my kids weren't there or anything like that. And they were just, um, I guess, about 30 of them, I, I would think. Like, And they were just all sort of <laughs> on my sofa. And, every, and then, yeah, I just, um, Paul Howard, the troop sergeant was amazing with me. And then I just, I, I, I can't even remember everything, but I remember wanting to know who who got to him and what way up he was laying and things like that. So, mm. yeah, I just needed to picture stuff and, and know that I'd, I knew everything that I could. Mm. Was it I, would ID? You get killed by an ID or was it? St- yeah. 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 He, um, I mean, in the inquest, they spoke through it and they said that he, he'd led the first viking he was in the vikings and um uh he'd actually stopped to get the inventory out because he said something don't smell right something's not right and then the inventory had checked um and then a, a bit later he was like oh do you know no it's fine it's fine like you know my bad like let, like time because of time and stuff let's crack on so he sent a threat and he got the infantry guys to go forward and sort of valen and yeah valen and yeah and yeah with the metal detectors yeah and that's the one okay and all that oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah and then literally i don't i can't remember how many yards but then they hit one which apparently i don't know all this detailed stuff but apparently it was a new type that would only be picked up by the weight of a military vehicle anyway is what i've been told mm-hmm. yes um i uh, was it Bastion you went back to? Yeah, yeah. And how long was he there for? Um, I can't remember the time. I remember feeling like it was ages. So, hang on, sorry. So, we, when you were in, were you in, when you were informed, reinformed, it was injured. No, you, okay. that's what I had in my head. So when I was walking down the road to my house, I was saying, "Oh God, Lee's been hurt. Lee's been hurt. I can't believe this. Lee's been hurt." And then when I got to my front door. 
I said, I said to the guys, are you looking for me? And um, they said, are you Corporal Lee Michael Scott's wife? And I said, yeah. And they said, can, can we go inside? And I was like, no, tell me what's happening like, on the doorstep. Um, and then they went, I went inside and they said, I lived in like a free tower. So they said, can we go upstairs to the lounge? And I said, no, like, tell me now. And I must have been getting Brooke out of the buggy at the same time because they, they then said, can you hand your baby to my colleague? And I was like, no. Like what? Like, and it, it's really weird because as a, as a wife, like since that, since Josh Hammond was killed, I was literally um, like every night going to bed having the nightmare of Lee getting killed. So then when you're told, it's like, I can't get my head around this. This doesn't seem real because I've just dreamt this for the last few days. So it, take, it took me months to like, because I just felt like he was still on tour. Like, you know, when you're like, it didn't go out that day and his toothbrush wasn't there and, you know, the washing was all done and put away. And do you know what I mean? It was really weird. It was just like the only difference was when the phone rang, I didn't go at like 100 miles per hour because I did, like, you know, there's a there's a type, there's a no, the number isn't there and you just know it's Lee's when he was out in Afghan. And then that stopped. And that was the only thing that I just felt like he was still on tour. It took me ages. I made myself go to medals parade in the December <laughs> to watch the lads on the parade square. It's like torture to myself, I think. But what, why did you decide to do that? Because I was like, I, I need to see that Lee's not on the on the parade square. And they, they'd also said about getting, I got the, uh, every widow gets given the Elizabeth cross. which And I was just like, I don't want it. Like, <laughs> I don't want a cross for my husband dying. And they're like, you're looking at it the wrong way. Like, it's, and I was like, I still now, I'm like, no, it doesn't, like, you get something for your husband dying. It doesn't feel right. And then, and then I, my VA was going through the different options. He was like, you do what you want to do. You can have it sent to you in the post if you want and never look at it. Like, and then I discussed with him, he was amazing. And I discussed with him and I said, I'd, I'd like to go, I'd like to receive it then with the lads when they receive their medal. Like, and it was almost like a, <laughs> almost like an up yours. Like I'm going to stand here in Lee's place but I didn't want to upset the lads either. I was going through weird like emotions of anger and all sorts of stuff. But I was like, I'll only do, I don't want to upset the lads, like make them all emotional when it's their proud time. But I felt like I wanted to represent Lee. So I, st I stood on the parade square with the injured and it snowed as I walked out as well. I was like, Bleh. and uh, so there I stood, yeah, next to Lee's driver, like, <laughs> oh God. And then I just went home. But I, it was like, cause I, cause I hadn't seen Lee's body either, which is my, Biggest, biggest regret that I I got advised not to see his body, and I so wish I had, because I know. Why because, would you go on? Because he would have seen mine. I know it. He would have just wanted to say goodbye, and I feel like that would have helped me, like, know that he's gone. So I made myself go on the parade square because I was like, this maybe this will make it sink in. It didn't, to be honest. <laughs> it just takes time for you to just suddenly think, okay. Like, and it was then the story of the charity because basically then it was like nine months after it was the following May, I think. And my cousin said to me, right, I'm going on holiday with the kids and you're coming with me. And I was like, no, I'm not going on holiday like that. A, that will look bad. <laughs> like you worry what people will think. It will look like I'm not grieving anymore. I don't want to go on holiday anyway without Lee. And and then she was just British. She was like, no, you are. Like, your mum's coming, my mum's coming, all the kids are coming. And it was like the best thing I could have done. Because Kai, my, he was five at the time, hadn't noticed. I'd noticed he'd changed as a little boy. Um, but I didn't realise quite how much. And then on that holiday, he relaxed and he laughed in the pool. And I had that weird, like, moment where you're like, oh my God, like Lee would be going nuts at me. Like I'm not, I need to sort myself out. And then like I started thinking, how many other kids are going through this? Like what is there for bereaved forces kids? Like I've had no one contact me about the kids yet. Like it's been nine months. Like what am I going to, you know, I'd been waiting for it and nothing could come to me. And that's when it all started. I was like, okay, I'm going to go home. I'm going to do my research. And then if there's nothing that helps these kids and it's wanted. Like I spoke to a couple of other widows that had messaged me after Lee had been killed on Facebook. Um, they'd lost husbands in like Iraq and Afghan earlier. And I just sort of said the idea 
and then, yeah, told my family and friends, OK, this is what we're going to do. This will keep Lee's memory alive and there's nothing out there that's doing this sort of stuff. So It's underestimated, uh, isn't it, about how much kids get impacted by anything? Yeah. Um, on the, you know, lyrics with the uh, Brooke and what's, your, what's his son's name? Kai. Brooke and Kai, yeah. you know, arguably experienced the worst of it. You know, a, 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 a yeah. A bereavement. Um, but it's easy to underestimate how much kids are impacted because they aren't great at communicating what they're feeling. Uh, if they, in a, you know, in an out, in an outgoing way, and I think nothing compared to what you gone through. Um, but I've gone through divorce, and it's taken me a while to realise how much Mike has been impacted by that. And you've got Sammy Ferguson as well, who's going through yeah. the same thing, and uh, you know, um, um. It's hard, and when, I think when it's when it's not obvious how some something's getting impacted, then the the need for something is not obvious either. Yeah. You know? But it surprises me nonetheless. It was not, that there's nothing out there like Scotty's Little Soldiers before. So yeah, I mean, yeah, when it's crazy. You, when was that? 2009? You decided or 2010? Um, 2010. It was yeah. So so how was Kai? How, how, when you talked about Kai, yeah. how was Kai impacted? Like what? what he um. So Kai's Kai at the time was five, just started school and. Like, like Lee, like I've, you know, I've, I've got to know now that actually Lee was an incredible dad. Like I didn't give him enough credit, to be honest. You know, you'd moan about your men, wouldn't you? But he, 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 um, he would always be on the floor playing with Kai, like always doing the school runs if he could. Kai's got, um, learning difficulties and he's autistic and he's got moderate hearing loss. There's a few things that Kai's at hospital about. Lee would always be there for, as long as he wasn't away, he was there. And um, and the same when Brooke was born, you know, like I didn't never had to ask for do bottles, nappies, like he was on it. He just loved it. Um, and my mates used to say to me, bloody it, like my husband don't do that. And I, I, I thought that was normal, but I've realised that it's not always like that. Uh, so he was a really good dad, you know, and um, Kai absolutely idolised him and loved the army. And when Kai, when Lee was on tour, I'll never forget this. Um Kai was on the kitchen floor and he had all his army toys out like the boys do when their dads are in the army and but I didn't realize how much he he like listens to conversations even at five and like all the people all the soldiers were called like Lee's troop like the guys so and then I was like oh they're, they're actual names yeah <laughs> but I was like oh Lee when he phoned one night, I was like don't tell Paddle but he lost his leg today like guys <laughs> it's that one-legged soldier Kai's got that's Paddle it was just bizarre and then after Kai when I told Kai it was the hardest thing because he's got learning difficulties uh it's just everything's black and white so you have to be really clear and honest and I wanted to be anyway because I didn't want to give him miss hope <coughs> But we'd never really experienced like anyone's death clo close to us. So I'd never really spoke about heaven. I didn't even really think about it. So that oh, that day, I, I must have been told like around two o'clock time. Weirdly, I worked out that when I'd had that rubbish night's sleep, I was actually awake with Kai and Brooke in my bed when it must have happened. Um, and then Kai, got take, Kai and Brooke got taken to... Um, because I remember saying to the guys, oh, I, I need to pick up Kai. I need to pick up, like, what am I going to do about Kai? And they said, we'll ring the school. And then I remember him being brought home by the head teacher or someone. And then I was saying, well, well, who can I ring to have Kai? Because my mates have all got, like, husbands out there. Like, what, who has anyone else been injured? What's been happening? And they weren't allowed to tell me anything out. They didn't know. They were saying, like, literally just, no, we'll know more details as the day goes on. But all we know at the minute is Lee's, Lee was killed. Um, so in the end, um, it got sorted. I can't even remember how so it's really black to be honest, but Lee got taken and Brooke to a friend's house. And then it was a Friday and my family live in Norfolk and it took like the M25 and well, it took like hours. It felt like hours. It definitely took hours for my mum and Lee's dad and that to get to the house. And then all of a sudden I just shut myself in my bedroom for ages. And then when I came out, my house was packed. It was bizarre. It was like my mum was there. Lee's dad was there. There was like Lee's sister, I think. Like some of my friends was just like. God. And then I remember Kai being brought home and he must he walked up the stairs and I just took him straight back up to his bedroom because there was so many people in the house and people were crying. And it was a really, and the news was on, you know, it's just it was really weird when I look back now. It's just like, God, what a horrible 
Um, so I just took him up on the bed and I ju- it was just me and him. And I just said to him, Kai, do you remember where dad is? And he said, yeah, a- Afghan. And I said, like, um, you know, daddy's like trying to, daddy's the goodies and they're trying to get the baddies. It's all the words you use. And it's just, and I said, I'm really sorry, Kai, but like daddy has been hurt and killed and he won't ever come home now. And it was just like, and I was crying and then he cried, but I don't think he knew what I was saying, to be honest. And and he said to me, oh, like you, you lied because daddy's coming home because we've got a tick chart. And I was just like, I have lied to, like, to him. And it took a long time for Kai to like trust, I think. And also going to bed was a big thing because Lee, that when he left, Lee had put Kai to bed. And then he'd gone at like early hours of the morning. So... I think, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, Kai, Kai didn't sleep for a long, long time, like would wake in the night loads. That was a big thing. And um, things like, um, he, ju- he just weren't the same little boy. He, he, he just went, withdrew, didn't re. I mean, I had to pick him up from school once. This is the only time I remember him having a massive outburst. Other than that, it was like silence where the the teacher said, like, we can't get him in off the field. He's shouting and he won't come in until his dad picks him up today. And things like that. And then gradually as the time went on, like that holiday and I look back and I think, God, he's completely... And even now, to be honest, and it's hard because as he grows, I don't know whether it's these learning difficulties, like he's got global development delays, so he's very delayed. So even though he's 16, he's probably like a seven-year-old in a lot of his ways. Global development delays. So dele- yeah. dele- they're affecting everything. Yeah, Basically, they can't diagnose one. He ticks boxes for lots of things. So he's got autistic traits and he's um, he's dyspraxic. So he struggles with his coordination. Um, but he, he's the best little boy, and like he's he speaks and he's intelligent, but he can't read or write. So, and he still plays with like his wrestlers and things, which you wouldn't normally expect a sixteen-year-old to do. But the love is he's just so loving and caring, and he's a smart little boy, you know. And um, little boy, I shouldn't say that, should I? Sixteen. Um, <laughs> But he, yeah, he just changed. He just really withdrew. And now it's really weird. Like when we do something at Scotty's and we have a big group event and this like a party, it's fun and that. He, the sparkle comes back. I don't know whether it's knowing that the kids all there are the same and he can just let his guard down. But it takes a lot to make him like, so when he really laughs nowadays, it's like, because oh, he just like, he doesn't enjoy life as much as what he should. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Oh, this is an emotional show. I feel like I'm on like <laughs> proper not, emotional. I'm not, I'm not I didn't expect this. <laughs> We're stopping it now. I did. <laughs> People will be turning off. We've like both, this is we've depressing. Both got, we've both gone twice. Right? <laughs> it will get happier. I promise. There's positives. <laughs> as, uh, do you see things improving in in, in Kaya's things yeah. as the years have gone on? It's just yeah, like, definitely, definitely, definitely. And interestingly. Um, like he he's brilliant little boy. Oh, not he's not a little boy, God. Um, and he's he, he's in a good place, and he's in a, a brilliant school now. And he, you know he's really coming into his own, and he's learning new stuff. And and he I just love lo- he's so different to Brooke. Like and strangely, I'll, I'll talk about Brooke. But strangely, I thought again naive. Brooke was only seven months old. She's not going to be impacted like Kai. She's not going to remember the t- the bad times or or have any memories of Lee, so she'll be all, all right. And you know, I've remarried and and I've had more kids, and so she's had a stepdad in her life from the age from a young age, you know. So she, you know, I'm like she'll be fine. And, and weirdly, it's her now that is the one that really struggles since probably about eight years old. She was asking me the questions that Kai asked me when he killed and even now Brooke, Brooke switched on really switched on she's just turned 12 and she will now still say to me hey, right you know you said dad died in Afghan well like have you got a map that you could show me where dad like and what so what was their mission she'll like ask like the proper stuff you're like Jesus Brooke like I thought I'd done this like seven years ago <laughs> like and I'm now having to re-go through it all and I think more will come like she googles him and you know she'll ask questions she's um so you relive it. And and one thing I've learned from obviously having my own kids and all the families we support Scott Scotties is the kids go through this. It doesn't matter how old they were or how long ago it was. There's different stages of their life when it will really hit. So starting senior school is a massive thing because 
Brooks just started senior school and she's doing amazing. She's caught, weirdly, her deputy head of her high school knew Lee and served as well, which was like, so she's got an instant bond of like, he didn't serve with Lee, but he knew Lee and was attached to one RTR when Lee was killed at the time. So remembers the impact it had on the regiment. And so weirdly, at her high school, she's got this instant connection to this guy who I said, she will probably stalk you because anyone attached to RTR or the army, like Brookie's like, um, but it's just, yeah, it's interesting how they, I think at her primary school, they, everyone knew the situation. It's a small school. Everyone knows what's happened to her dad. So when Remembrance comes around or they're doing about World War Two or something, the teachers are a little bit like, okay, you know, think about Brooke. When you go to high school, weirdly, the the notes don't always go with the kids and you've got a load of different teachers and a load of different kids and no one knows what's happened unless you're then got to go back through it all. And you do you know what I mean? It's a weird, which is another yeah. way Scott is now steps into the, with the schools. That's what we're working on to work with schools to make sure that they're aware of the situation. There's been some, yeah, Brooke's been lucky, but there have been some kids that have had some awful situations where you're like, that should what, never have. What do you mean? Go on. Just kids um, where the school didn't have a clue. The high school didn't know that, that they'd lost their dad on tour. Um, for one I'm thinking of, and they made them sit through a whole like presentation about Afghanistan. And the poor kid was in the middle of the class and didn't want to make a scene. Um, and wasn't aware that was going to happen that day. And, you know, obviously, and and that could have so been so different. That kid did not have to go through that. And, um, yeah, even, you know, it's just little things like, you know, if you're going to do something around remembrance or something, make sure that kid knows it's coming, ask him if they want to be there. And if they don't, put them on the end so they can sneak out or, you know, just little things that, yeah. Mm. It's hard, isn't it, it's trying to manage something like that? It's, and on the one hand, it, I think you can think, Oh, well, it's life and let them get on with it. But on the other hand, it, it, it's just not quite, it's not quite as simple. No, exactly. <laughs> and there's a lot of things like we're, we're like, we're, we're trying, as Scott is, we try and help the kids to thrive and develop and yeah, um, learn how to cope so they don't hit those crisis points basically. Um, but f sometimes, you know, and we, we've still got a lot of work to do and the, the kids, I mean, you, every time you get a new family join Scott is, you think you've heard the worst story. Do you know what I mean? And then you hear another, like for me, you know, I lost Lee in Afghan and that, that's bad enough. Like there's no, but there's, you know, that I feel for the, the girls that were pregnant and then the, the, the guys never got to meet their baby and they had to go through labor. I think like when I get one of those, I think, God, God like, I don't know how I would have done that. Um, and then to have no photographs, um, and then there's there's all different, you know, the suicides and stuff. So we support kids that have lost parents. Um, however, you know, as long as they served in the military. So there's all accidents, illnesses, heart attacks, missing in action, suicides. And it's, yeah, so no, no, no death is the same and no family is the same. So it just hits them all differently. And yes. Well, um, before Scott was set up and you were dealing with things with um, with uh, Brooke and Kai. Yeah. What were you able to draw on? And so, in fact, what su what support did you did you need that that? And where did you get it from? Before I mean, before uh, Scotties existed. Yeah. So because I'm, I'm assuming Scotties has helped you know you were yourself, although you founded Scotties, you were also a beneficiary of the support, right? Yeah, the kids are. Yeah, definitely. And and oh, the, ki the kids are. Sorry. Yeah. The kids are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and it's um, uh, yeah, I'd be lying if like from day one, Scotties saved me like completely, like kept me from that that holiday I then came home and I was like a woman on a mission do you know what I mean like I, and I've you know I said to you before I worked in nursery schools and pubs like I have no idea what it takes to run a charity didn't even really think about it um but I my brother <laughs> who um is now like the chief exec of Scott is and he was a marketing manager before and he has just been by my side the whole time so seen it and he's probably got the brains of it I tell him this is what the kids need. This is what I want to do. And then he's like, whoa, let's do this the right way and put the foundations down. We want this to be a, a charity that will last until, you know, these kids are 25. So we need to do this right. And, and um, so he's the one that, that runs the charity, to be honest. I take the credit and he, <laughs> he's the one behind me. 
But um, it's just good because it got to the point, it was uh, all right at, at the start, but it got to the point where it was like, I can't do this anymore. Like I, if, I, I, if I'm helping a few kids, but the need is so, like these families desperately need, there's more and more gaps that I'm seeing, I never realised. Um, so I, if we want the charity to really get behind these kids, I need help because I haven't got the skills to do this. Um, and I mean, to answer your question, back then, I feel like I had the best family and friends ever and like never underestimate the people around you. They might not understand what's going on like other widows and widowers, but they would do anything for me. I used to have some of the lads come round and cook me tea because I wasn't eating. I remember waking up one morning and I opened the curtains and it was snowing and there was two of, two or three of them shoveling snow off my drive and you're just like, oh, like these lads have just been to Afghan. They're single lads from the block and someone has just thought about me and the kids. Do you know what I mean? And that little stuff was just amazing back then. And I had, I got the welfare team and the regiment were brilliant with me. Like I've heard horror stories and it's interesting how different people get on with their visiting officer. I think that's a key, like whether they connect or not. Um, but for me, mine would, mine was amazing and was always and I still speak to him he's left now and he lives in Cyprus weirdly right around the corner from my dad but <laughs> he him and his wife became like a mum and dad to me and my kids and that was my biggest support but so so I I would go to the welfare and say like I need some help for Kai and I remember Kai seeing a play therapist and it was all done through the regiment but I don't think that that doesn't happen if I'm honest that was a me asking the right people and speaking out and some people don't have that in them to do that at that time and also you know there's little things like I just remember like uh, the like the the padre had come around the house to talk about the funeral but Kai was there and I was like I don't want this conversation happening I don't want anything like this happening around Kai so you know it, it's just little things like okay who's who's going to watch Kai for me now like if I had no friends or family how would this work? Do you know, just little things. And I just want to, I wanted to make sure, I mean, back then it was the charity was the goal was to have holiday homes. So families could have a break like I did and just know that, you know, everything's there. It's safe. It's on a Haven site. There's 24 hour security. You can be a young mum in your twenties and go with two little kids and just have a change of scenery. Um, and then, yeah, as we went on, we were like, okay, the more we speak to these families, the more we realize that they don't all go don't have the VOs that I had. They don't have the care that I had. And there's more and more gaps depending on how old the kids are. You know, the teenagers especially. There's not the right stuff in place for them. And they feel forgotten. You li you literally, you know, you, you're in that garrison. And, and then all of a sudden, you've got to deal with the fact that <coughs> your husband's never going to come home and your whole future's changed. And, and then you've got, this house isn't mine. Like, this isn't my home. I'm miles from my mum. Um, Kai's in a school that is full of military kids and probably all the teachers are married to military personnel. Like, where the hell do I go? What do I do? You, and you suddenly, even though you're in that strong community and your mates are amazing, you don't feel like you fit in that community anymore. And and that's a weird feeling as well that you, you've then like got to think, I don't want to leave because I love it here, but I don't belong here without Lee. So where am I going to go and and that's the the amazing thing about scott is, is it it brings a community back the kids often feel disconnected again from the military there's sometimes a lot of hate which i get because there's all different situations um but they they love like meeting the fam being part of the scotty family they call it because it's like everyone gets it everyone understands and you feel that con connection to the military again yeah it's a really interesting point you raised there that not <coughs> i'm not really I haven't really thought about it before just because I've not talked about it before but that, that it, you know the there's impact on kids when they lose, lose a parent or lose anyone close to them right and then you know we're talking about um military you know children from military families and you just you know you just highlighted the point there they lose they lose a, a parent but also in the aftermath they're going to lose their whole environment is going to change mm -hmm. be turned on its head as was yours you know yeah whole life turned on its head moving schools moving moving potentially moving towns and cities you know uh moving houses it, everything changes yeah it's, it's uh a flipping nightmare absolute yeah. nightmare which i which it's just the fact that it's you're in the military a part of the military community makes it a, a, a 
multiple factors of nightmare compared to a civilian loses. Yeah. I mean, it's a nightmare for anyone, you know. Yeah. I, I, again, it wasn't me saying, oh, civilians got easy. Fucking hell, I'm not saying that. <laughs> yes, I learned the point. Yeah, yeah I, I hadn't thought about that, Nikki, actually. Yeah, completely upturned. Just to, life turned on its head. Um, how many families are you looking after now? Um, there are 400, this year we've done 450 kids. So there's over 200 families when they're split. But there's, there's still, everyone says to me, that's amazing. I'm like, it's not because there's still hundreds of kids out there that don't yet know about Scotties. And that's like frustrating. It's, uh, and again, Stuart will be in my ear going, it's, we're getting there. We're doing this. We've got to reach these kids, but we've got to have the funds there to be able to fund everything we do at Scotties. So at Scotties, we've got like um, four programs that we run. It's all growing. The thing I love is growing so naturally and organically. Like we didn't have a massive pot of money and then go, how should we spend this? And we never have done it like that. We've always done, let's, let's ask the families, let's work out where the need is and then let's go and raise the money to fill that need. That's how we've always worked. And so naturally we've gone from the holidays which are still important because it's still about reminding the kids that they've not been forgotten you know and when they go on those holidays they're like they're like they're not just your bog standard caravan do you know what i mean these are proper nice lodges and you walk in and you're like wow like fundraisers people have gone out and fundraised so i can be here do you know what i mean and there's little touches like there's a scotty mascot on the wall and there's little things and and they're filled with toys and an xbox and the families just say to us when you walk through the door you feel like the love because you know the, why you're on that holiday and they also sometimes it will naturally make the kids start to talk about their dad where they haven't done before um which is always obviously a good thing good to talk um and it just brings them together and also to give them just new happy memories. Like for Kai, I wanted Kai to be able to look back on his childhood and not see it completely be black, you know? Like I wanted him to see, oh, we still had a lot. We had we went on that holiday and that holiday and we did this and and um so so that we have the Smiles program, which is the holiday, the Christmas party where we bring the kids together. That's incredible. And all the fun stuff. So we send them gifts at tough times of the year, like the anniversary of their parents' death. So we don't say you're getting this because it's your dad died five years ago. We're just saying, here's a little something from us because we know it's tough this time of year. And to have, it's those little things, so they get a £20 voucher. And and we do surveys at Scotty's, so got to jump around, sorry. But we do surveys at Scotty's so we get to know the kids so that we can tailor everything. So they're not just sent a voucher that's like, oh, cool, but I don't shop there. You know, if a kid says, I love super dry, you know, we'll do a super dry voucher, you know, so... Um, and that's hard when you've got 450 of them, you know, it's quite a big job. Um, so every birthday, every Christmas, every anniversary of their parents' death, they're sent something and it doesn't matter whether they lost their dad, you know, a year ago, 10 years ago, they will always get that on, on that date and they know someone is thinking of them and remembering them. And that speaks volumes for the families, massive. No age limit. Yeah, yeah, there is an age limit. So when they turn 19, they go into our new Springboard program and that is about, that's 19 to 25 and that is about helping them move into the future. It's really new because again, the the guys at 19, they'd, they'd often say, like we'd say, oh, you no longer a member of the charity. It sounds really rubbish. So we don't say stuff like that, but they then volunteer. They come back and help the younger kids. It's amazing. They fundraise. They're still in touch with us. But, what they were telling us is actually 19 is a really important time in their life where lots of them are going off to uni, leaving home, and often they're like, I was the man of the house for the guys, and now I've left my mum and my little sister alone and I feel guilty, and there's like lots of new things going on at 19. You, you, you've just passed your driving test, or you might have met someone and got married, <laughs> yeah, going out on the drinks, there's all, and, it, and a lot of them have been so strong, and then all of a sudden it hits them, then so we bought in springboard to support them up to 25 but that they don't receive all the gifts but they get the different the mentoring and the you know helping with uni grants and applications and they get uh, there'll be programs that they can go on and it's that support network and peer mentoring and stuff so that's really exciting that's amazing yeah and, and we didn't and even think yeah. about that that part you know and then it's listening to the kids again actually like they've yeah, it was interesting. It's like a, late, a few of them sat with me and just said, like, it's a really hard time. And even though we know Scotties will always be there, it's, 
and sometimes we, they don't they're like we don't need to use Scotties all the time you know we don't need to be on the phone or receive the gifts but just knowing it's there is like really important for them even at that age so yeah with the uh with the kids with your experience now of dealing with um bereaved families especially on the children's side what um what seem when when they lose a parent what seems to be the biggest impact on them what 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 do they miss what do they what do they miss what do they need um oh, it's, a t- it's hard i think um i almost don't want you to answer it because i'm going to burst into tears again <laughs> oh no no it's different for all of them as well <laughs> 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 Hey, have I got black running all down my eyes? Oh, no, I knew right. I should have I, put I, eyeliner on. I, 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 I need to put some tissues on the table next time. <laughs> yeah. you're, not, you're not coming again. <laughs> <God>. um, <laughs> it's, it's so different. It depends on the age of the kids, if I'm honest. Like, it's it's the little things, isn't it? Like, the kids say to us, they, Brooke has said before, they she sees... Uh, and, th- and this is Brooke with no memory of being with Lee, but when she sees families together... And I've had a, a, a few other k- kids that have said when they've gone on holiday and they see families together, they're jealous. Um, but there's there's so much that and like you know, I I remember that, um, a kid um, or a mum sending me a video of one of the lads and he'd gone to our holiday home with his uncle and aunt, and um, he's he le- he'd done his first shave with his uncle mm-hmm. in our Scotty lodge and he was like really ch- he was like this is something my dad would have taught me to do, but. My uncle done it, but we'd done it in the Scotty Lodge because it felt... And I was like, that's amazing. So think li- silly little things. And Kai, I'll never forget when Kai... We were in Tesco's once, and this is like ages, up, like probably a year or so after. And then for this little kid to go, oh, the- we don't need to get those yogurts, do we anymore, Mum? Because they're the yogurt. And that's how it gets you. They're the yogurts Dad used to have. And you're like, you could just be having quite a normal day. And you're like where the hell does that come from? And then you're in a weird, you're taken right back and you're in a weird place again. And and that's Kai just randomly saying it. He was fine. He was just, he was just, but I think, God, like a year or so on and he's just having a little memory come back of obviously, he used to say to me as well, look, look at me, mum, look at me. I've got my arm out with a window like dad used to do when he was driving. <laughs> it's like little things. And they're things that I think, oh, I hope he doesn't forget like stuff like that. But for the kids at Scott, well, the, the way they're impacted, like anxiety is massive in the kids. In general? Yeah, like the, oh, loads of them. Anxiety, like the, the I don't know whether it's the fall. Uh, uh, this year has be, seen a massive rise because I think that panic of what, what if something happens to my remaining parent. Um, people around me are getting ill and catching coronavirus. and But in general, anxiety is always... A big thing with the kids, yeah. Uh, you know, for Kai, like, for example, he wouldn't go to bed very well and wouldn't sleep through a night because he was obviously anxious that I wouldn't be there when he woke up in the morning. And if I'd go away for a night, that would be a big thing for him when he was younger. But so many of the kids, yeah, massive anxiety of what's going to happen if something else, you know, they've they've got... It's hard, isn't it? As a kid, you don't expect to lose someone that important in your life that's always there. And then to think they start they start to think what what happens if I lose this parent or what happens if so it happens to me or I don't want to go through what this you, again. What do you say to reassure them? How can you do it? I don't, to be fair, <laughs> but the team do because <laughs> I'm <laughs> not qualified. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so this is where this is and this is as the charity's growing. It you start to realise that like this is important stuff that we are responsible for. And um, we need to have the right people in place that are professionally trained to deal with. So that's where, you know, we now have a sport worker that's there. And and we, you know, we signpost. We're a bit of a hub. So we will, um, you know, if a, if a family get in touch and say, I'm really concerned about, you know, my kids. And then if they're suicidal or anxiety or, the, you know, we'll refer them for bereavement counselling or to see someone for mental health. And then what we find is there's massive waiting lists as anything. So then our support worker will step in to offer some guidance, advice, keep in touch with that family until they are on the right path to the the professional support that they need, if that makes sense. Well, um, it does make sense. Do you know what the military, uh, do they have any obligations to support the families, children and families who 
So for it's, a period of time, what, what, are the, what are the there must be obligations there in some, in well, some way. What, what are there's, they, there's, yeah. there's things like um, so you can stay in your army quarter for I think it is now two years, things like that. So oh, you okay. Get two years in your house. What did it used to be? Six months. What, That's what that? I was told. Okay. Which is like, I just like wow. When when I was at six months, <laughs> like to make that decision. Um. I mean, everyone's different, aren't they? So some people are just like, I know families that are like on it, like they're out of there. They're like, I don't want to be here. Whereas I was completely different. I was like, I'm not leaving. <laughs> I was like, as long it's as I'm it's here. Also, it's also personal circumstances one, isn't it? Which is it's, a lot yeah. comes into when support of the children. It's like, you know, he, he, I would think he, where I was, where I was based in Collie and my the mother of my kids, you know, all her, she got a massive support network in that area. And if anything had happened, and you know, um, if anything had happened, she had a big support network there. And it, don't get me wrong, it would have been hideously hard. Yeah. But you compare that to some to a lot of families who they're completely on their own. You know, they they're based somewhere. They maybe they haven't got living, a lot of living relatives around who can support them. Maybe they don't speak to them. That's one side of it in terms of the, the the sort of the family network and the friends network. Then the other side of it is is uh, uh, financial standing, mm-hmm. you know, you know and, and things like education levels. And it, it sounds little things, but all they all come together to uh-huh. they're basically indicate of how much support do do you need that you cannot provide for yourself. Yeah, you know. And when we're talking about um, military personnel. You know, unless we're talking about officers, really, then the majority of us, and I am, I, I am, this is a broad stroke of the brush, I understand that, but yeah. the majority of us, we don't come from, you know, rich, affluent backgrounds. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not, it's not always there. It, well, rarely there. All the support, all the support they could possibly need is not always there. Yeah. You know, and, and sometimes the support can be offered, like you're saying, uh, the NHS can provide services, maybe the, you know, but it, it you don't get prioritised. <laughs> no. Whereas so a, a charity like yourself has that ability. You're there purely for one demographic of the of the of the people who need it. Yeah. You know, military families, yeah. kids. Yeah. yeah. And they you know, like like you touched on there. There's families. There's all different situations and all different scenarios where. And you you got. I remember a family that they were saying, and I'd never even thought about it myself. So they their kids were in boarding school you know, in a really good private education. And then she had to move out of the quarter and it wasn't, you know, a, a, it was, uh, it wasn't a killed in action or if there was no big, big compensations like everyone thinks there is. And so her finances were massively in jeopardy and they ended up moving to a council estate and their kids, they couldn't find a placement for the kids. So the kids went to a local school, a school miles from the house that was a world away from what they'd just come from. And I just think they have to go through all that on top of trying to get used to the fact that their dad's no longer with them. There's all different scenarios. And it's just trying to work with that family. And even if we can't, you know, we can't make everything okay and we can't do everything to help, but it's knowing that there's someone there to chat to, to talk things through. You know, some of the biggest decisions you have to make after losing someone, you just want that other person there to say, you know, you'd always make them big decisions together and then all of a sudden it's all on your shoulders. You know, if this is like the biggest decision I have to make. Where do I move to? And I can't talk to Lee about it, you know, and that so making sure the families know, you know, we're here. And also, the, you know, we've got a private um, website where the families can log on and we've got a private Facebook page and stuff. So, and the, the families help each other. There's always someone that... Um, you know, they can put on there, like, has anyone else been through this? I've got a 12-year-old that is, you know, going through this at the minute. And that the the parents are amazing with each other. Like some, And just sometimes Scottish just fatili- facilitates things like that because actually knowing other people that have been through it is like a lifesaver in itself. Just that having people there to listen and support you and help you is, like, massive. But, yeah, there, there's... There's so many gaps, it's scary, but I'm just, I'm really chuffed now that Scotty's is there and it's doing what it does. It's still a long way to go. Like there's still lots more that we want to be able to do and so many more families that we need to reach. Like I hate the thought of people suffering and not having that community that we could offer them. Um, but like, we'll get there. That's the, we just need people to help spread the word. So doing things like this is the way forward. Yeah, but like, 
like you're saying, the way that the way the charity structured and the way they, the, and in the way, um, not the way the charity structured, but the sheer nature of what you do and who you who you support. They, they're just going to keep. They're going to when they when they stop needing the support, they're going to keep supporting the charity because so, they're not supporting the charity, they're supporting the other families, they're supporting people like themselves who were yeah. ten, fifteen years ago. You know, um, I've got a qu- I want to I've got a question here from one of my Patreon supporters. Um, and we, in fact, I think I think we might have talked about it. A guy called Alan Rankin. Uh, I'll, I'll forget to ask it otherwise. But I think it's. Uh, do you feel? Do you feel? Sorry, I put. <coughs> I, I basically I put out a call for questions from a Patreon supporter. So I said, Nikki, Nikki Scott's coming on. All right. Do you feel that the Army Stroke MOD should already have been pro- providing some of the support services to the children that Scotty's Little Soldiers offers, in particular the health and well health and well-being support and counselling? Uh, P.S. He's apps. Well, I'll say it as him. I'm absolutely in awe of what you guys do year in, year out, and can't wait to get back to some proper fundraising next year. Alan Rankin. There you go. <laughs> I'm assuming you know Alan. <laughs> I've, I've definitely know the name, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it was him at all. I'm sure it was him and said, <coughs> Why haven't you had Nicky Scott on yet? <laughs> oh, that was Tom. <laughs> Tom, that was Tom, yeah, Tom yeah. Turner. Tom yeah. Turner, yeah. Um, oh, I don't know. And I try not to get involved in the. I try not to get involved in the what should be done, what isn't being done, and try and focus on the positives I just I think the biggest the biggest biggest thing is for me is that you you, as a I mean I don't I can't speak for everyone but I felt like if it wasn't for Lee's regiment they were amazing just forgotten if I'm honest and that sounds horrible and I know that's not the veteran or the the guys like they will never forget but you do literally feel like you're like my god Lee just served his country and uh, and even the guy, not just the guys that died in action, you know, any, any, you know, we support families that have illnesses and all, you know, all sorts of situations, but they've all served the country. And then all of a sudden you just feel like you've been forgotten and pushed to the side. And that is, uh, yeah, that's, I, f- I feel like the kids should be getting the very best support whenever they need it. Like to me, that is my drive. Like I'm going to make sure however it's done and whoever does it, it just needs to be done. Mm. And um, that I don't want, you know, I, want, I feel like we owe it to the guys and girls to make sure their kids are looked after now. Like, I know for a fact if there was a charity like Scott is around before, Lee would be backing it and helping it because potentially it could be supporting his kids. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just feel like the guys and girls in the military, like it's like, you know, we could potentially be helping your kids. So it's so important. Yeah. Like, so I kind of dodged the question because I don't like. No, it's fine. I I, 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 like I don't. I, it's again. It's not what should sort of what should, not what should be. It's what could be done. I mean, that, when I think about things like this, it's uh, I'm like you. And I've got a lot of respect for HM forces. I've got a lot of respect for. for I, I fucking serve with them, right? <laughs> and and, uh, and also, it's not easy. It is not easy, right? The reality. The reality is that the pr- the reality is that the primary concern of the military is. The people who are living, who are who's who are part of the military, that's the reality because it's the nature of the beast. Yeah. Like, um, same with any organisation, really, any flipping company down the road. Someone dies in work, you know, then yeah. the priority is still the people who are alive and make you know, and doing what the company's doing. Exactly. It's just the reality of it. But what what um, what sort of become apparent to me over the last I don't know six months to a year of doing this, the podcast is, I had assumed that. Or like this, the, the, the welfare support offered to the military was sort of standard across the board. Power Edge is really, really good at it. I hadn't realised. Like, I, it just I thought, oh, this is just what it is. This is what happens. This is what you get. Not what you get monetary. I'm just saying this is the support you get, yeah. and this is how people are going to treat you, and the, you know all that stuff. It ain't the case. It ain't the case. And you seem to have a similar experience to me in terms of good welfare support from the RTR. Yeah. You know, whether that was whether they were sort of dodging some <laughs> dodging some rules or not, right? And it's sort of the same with you know. Power Edge and Laura McFully me there, you know, she pulling some strings, bending some rules to get critical support there yeah. immediately. But it ain't the case across the board. And it's and it seems to be certainly very different where that support is much less of a standard than it is elsewhere when it's a unit that when it's uh, sort of support in arms, I think, where that unit does not operate as a unit together or squadrons together. Yeah. Things like well, here we go, Sammy Ferguson, right? Yeah. Uh, things like the medics, they they go off individual pairs and they go and get attached to other units yeah so and so it just it just means that there's a different type and nature and need of support generally speaking in like the remc yeah and, but unfortunately 
sometimes as seems to be the case it doesn't it doesn't provide support where it's needed in the right way and that's not me picking on the RMC I'm just the difference between yeah regiments Definitely. as opposed to corps yeah you know um uh and uh, will that ever change I don't know can it ever be changed to the standard where it's needed? Probably not. Just the nature of the beast, which is where you know people people like yourself come in and Scotties comes in. Yeah, yeah. And we've got we've got families, interestingly, that um, some of them don't want to be like we 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 did this campaign a little while ago called Reconnect, and um, Brooke met with Sergeant Paul Howard that um, that was um, Lee's troop sergeant, and she. He was really nervous. He's he's carried guilt around for a long time, and it openly said that he was suffering with PTSD. I'd not really spoke to him. I'd not really kept in touch with him. Didn't really know him to be honest. Um, before you know, I'd say hello and stuff, but not like a a friend friend. Um, and he, I reached out to him and said, Brooks at the point where she really needs to know. She really needs to speak to someone that served with Lee, but not like his mates. Like she wants to know from someone who was on tour with him, almost in charge of him, um, would you be up for meeting him? And then I dropped the bombshell of, can we record it? <laughs> because this could potentially be something that other families could do. And uh, he he was seeing a counsellor and he was amazing and he, you know, he, he did it and they were incredible. Um, and I was so proud of Brooke because she she was really nervous of meeting Paul and not knowing... What did Brooke want to know? What was it she wanted to know? She just what wanted happened? to know a bit of what happened, but more what it was like out there, what her dad was like from someone else. Um, and I said to her, you can ask him anything. So, And I'm not even going to be in the room. I'm going to go. Like Uncle Stu will be here and Stephen's going to film. That's it. It's just going to be you four. Um, and because I wanted her to just ask, just be herself and ask him, you know, and... Um, they were both nervous and I said to Brooke before I said you know Paul's nervous as well Brooke because you know he he feels quite guilty and he's worried about what you're going to ask him and she said why does he feel guilty and I said because you know he was in charge of dad's troop um when dad died and and she was like well that's stupid he didn't put the bomb there did he like and and when they spoke it was just it did them both so much good they really benefit and she you know he said to her about she said you know my dad my mum tells me stories about my dad and he was funny and crazy and did lots of silly things and annoyed people quite a lot sometimes <laughs> um but was what was he like at work like was he like that at work and it was just really good to hear someone else talk about Lee in a professional role as well and it really helped her to be like okay my dad actually was really good at his job and you know like and and was well thought of in the army and actually wasn't silly all the time. He really did actually, you know, lead these men on that day. And it was just a really good thing. And I've, I've spoke to a few people since. And uh, Tom Turner, for example, who said about this show. Now, uh, he, I have not, I spoke to him since, like, I think probably Lee's funeral. So t 11 years ago. And um, he reached out to me because you'd said, yeah, cool, get her on the show. And he was like, holy shit, now I've got to ring Nikki and I've not done this for uh, 10 years. Yeah. He said that. He said, I best I, be, I, I best get in touch with her. And I was talking to her about a year or so. <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it like, and he said, um, and then he's come to see me since. And it was amazing. And he said, um, we're, we're scared. Like sometimes you don't, and I've heard this before about another guy that I met on a VO course. I went on a VO training course with some guys and um, spoke and um, one of the guys said, oh, I think you support a family I know. And then I was saying to him, you know, well, do you, he was like, I was best man at their wedding. I was like, oh, amazing. Like, do you see him? And he was like, no, I've not seen him for years. Like, I don't dare get in touch. And I said, like, why? And he said, because, you know, you look on Facebook and she's doing well and like um, they seem happy. And like, if I come back. I'm going to bring back all those bad memories. And I was like, believe me, them bad memories are there. Like whether you're around or not, you know, just because someone looks really happy on Facebook, like, you know, I've moved on, I've remarried, got, got more kids. And, um, but I still grieve for Lee every single day. And I just sort of said, you know, everyone's different, but if I was you, you know, and, and we can do it through Scotties if you want, you know, we can put a feeler out and see the response. But I said, I absolutely love it. And the kids more than anything need it. Like when someone gets in touch that knew Lee is like, it's amazing feeling. And for the guys as well, like Tom, 
hearing about Brooke and stuff and he's going to come back and see Brooke and Kai and you know and it was just it's it's important I think for everyone I mean there will be families that are like I don't want anything to do with anyone you know that like I'm I'm done with the army and that I wonder whether that will change as time goes on because I remember being angry at everything and everyone but then there's different situations but I just think the guys that actually served together like I just think the kids even if it's a letter or a card and that's another thing like the regiment you know it's like what why don't regiments just send a card at Christmas or something just to show we still remember you guys and when I was thinking about this I was like actually it's not always the MOD or the regiment's force is it because the families move and they don't you know I didn't think oh, I'm going to move so like again since I'm not going to write to Lee's regiment and let him know my new address like 10 years later. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't feel quite right. And then I realised, but Scott is always has Afbury family's addresses because they know if they move, they won't get their gifts or they need to keep in touch with us about different support. So we always have, we're always engaging. There's always like a text message service and there's almost emails every week. We send an email to our families, giving them the latest news and stuff that's going on. So you, so you, you know. Sometimes we're like, actually, we know where the families are, if if they're a part of Scotties. So if someone wanted to get in touch, you could do it through Scotties. I've gone totally round the houses. Can't no, no, remember what fine. I started talking about. I, I mean, the, the fa- <laughs> it, it is diff- it, it's difficult keeping in touch with brief families from individuals. So obviously, as you, as you have, we all have. We've got um, friends who've been um, killed. Uh, uh, of military friends have, be, have been killed and it's I think for me it's a constant it's a constant I need to reach out to X, Y or Z because I haven't done it in ages in the back of my mind constant, constant, constant but it's also just, yeah. there's quite a few <laughs> that's, yeah. that's one and two there's almost a, there's almost a subconscious because you it's all. It's almost like readdressing it yourself. Yeah. In in a in a really mild way. Yeah. In a really mild way, um, and they're invariably all over the country. And plus, it wouldn't. For me, it doesn't feel like doing it, doing someone justice to pick up the phone and call them. Yeah. People like that, I want to go and see them in person because yeah. I care. You know, I, yeah. like genuinely, I'm I'm not like doing this because oh, I should keep in touch. I'm doing it because I I I, yeah. I understand. Yeah. This is hard. Regardless yeah. of whether you, you know, regardless of what age, whether it was it died, regardless of how old you are experiencing the grief or whether it was 10, 15 years ago yeah. or five years ago. But it, it, it's tough to sort of maintain that, uh, we just maintain that communication just, just because of life, just life. Yeah, right? of course, yeah. And then from the, I mean, from the military aspect, not defending them, man, the practicalities of getting my... <laughs> yeah. Of keeping a database of all the people being killed and sending cards, exactly. for example. Yeah, I get now, that. For some units, totally. some units, how big would that? How yeah. big would the database be? Yeah, and then and it's just an escalating cost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then where do you start it? Because it's not been done. Where do you start it? Should we start it an Afghan campaign? Because if we start, why aren't we including people who died in Iraq? Yeah. Hang on a minute. What about <laughs> what about the first Iraq Gulf? Yeah. What about people in Bosnia? What about you know, all of that? Yeah, you know, yeah. I, yeah. I, that's me not defending. It's just one. No, I get it, and I get it, and I think that's where we were kind of doing this reconnect campaign where we were saying, actually, do you know what? It isn't. Yeah, we totally get that. Families move around, people lose touch, people have got busy lives, and like I said to Tom when he came to see me. I was like, don't, he's like, I'm sorry that I haven't, like, it's, it's shocking that I haven't been to that. And I was just like, God, I get it. And I, I, you have to be in a good place to be able to come and do this. And I, I've, you know, Lee's got mates that it's took, like, like Tom, 10 years before they were in a fairly steady place to be able to reach out. And I, and I think anyone with a heart gets that um, the guys are going through their own grief and their own stuff that they've got to deal with before they can get in touch. But I, I just think it's a good, like for Brooke and Paul, it was just quite special. And now she like, she's written him a Christmas card. Do you know what I mean? And it's just little things. And I think that she don't need to hear from Paul now all the time. Like she's met him, she's asked her questions, but there was like a bond there instantly for both of them. It was really, it was really weird. And now I just think, and then like Paul dropped me a text a little while ago and, and I could say to Brooke, oh, Paul's just text me. And it was just good. Do you know what I mean? And that, that to me was like, and apparently Paul was like the best thing I could have done. 
like all on a selfish thing for me as well. Like it has actually helped me to get over some of the things that I had going on in my head. Not everything, obviously, but um, so so it can work. It's not always going to work, is it? And not all the families are going to want to do it. I guess everyone's different, like we said, but. Yeah, was, everyone's was, different, but there's some, you know, everyone's different, and the, but there are some core requirements that all the family's going to have, which is what you guys are there for, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and we've got, we've got. Um, I might. This was. This will sound corny. It will sound like I'm like doing a like an advert, but we've got um, a new thing. This is exactly why we've got it called Overwatch, and it's um, it's basically it's kind of aimed at the guys and girls that serve or served, and it's almost like if you want to feel like you're watching over um the the kids that you've lost contact with the guys and girls that have lost someone you know and you want to watch her make sure their kids are being looked after we do this thing and it, we call it overwatch and you basically you pledge to give a donation monthly donations it's like reg regular giving but like we don't send you a teddy bear or whatever you know you but you get access to a portal and you become part of the Overwatch community. And that basically gives you access, exclusive access. You log on and you see videos of the team behind the scenes. And so you know that that tenor you've given every month is, you know exactly where it's going. 100% of that Overwatch um, donations are going to helping the kids that have fallen, of the fallen. And like it was, a, it was a way of like, okay, if you can't reconnect because you're not in that position, here's another way you can make sure their kids are being looked after without making a massive song and dance about it. And it's that is pretty good. Because that is another thing. People, people don't want to feel like they, they are making a song and dance about yeah. it. Or I'm, I'm doing this because I want the recognition. Yeah. You know, I, I get that. Yeah. 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 We've learned that as well. That, that often it's just like, actually, I want to make sure his kids are getting looked after, but I don't really want to talk about it i just want to know they're they're all right and so we were like that we could do that this would work this would be something so it's it's slow and we want there we've got lots of plans this year we want to really build it but we're already starting to put the content there and seeing it grow and we're just like god you know what if everyone gave a five or a ten or whatever a month like that could potentially fund a really strong support program for these kids so it's there's so many different ways isn't there and and with this year we're just like actually like we launched that at the beginning of this year, I think it was. And then when COVID hit, we were like, there's the future of fundraising, like <laughs> right there, because you don't have to go to an event. It's all digital, it's all online, and you get to see exactly where your money goes. It's just new f new ways of doing things, isn't it? This year has mm -hmm. taught us that as well. But And transparency and transparency is the main thing with charities especially. Massive, yeah. yeah. Huge, yeah, for us. Always, we've always tried to do like everything right and and be as transparent as possible because yeah charities get given bad names sometimes i sometimes think people have the right heart but they just do it in the wrong way and it gets messy with charities and i think it's important to make sure you're just transparent all the time and you're open and honest and that is something we're always like we always put up our annual accounts online and but we don't just put them up we explain so we do a video behind them to explain this is what this number means. So people don't just assume. I just, I just yeah, we're just very open. We're open with, as a team as well. Our, Scott, our team, there's a team of 12 of us now and everything's open and honest and quiet. Yeah. It's yeah. a good culture. It, it's it, a good way to be. I'm, I'm glad. And one of the things you said when we started talking uh, earlier is um, when you had the thought about providing something for, you know, bereaved kids and you, you said, one of the things you did was to check there was a need. You wanted to support the family. That's, that's an important one, you know. Uh, I, that's um, and that can be one of the frustrations I think people have is charities getting set up when there's no need. But the reality is with with the reality is with charities. I mean, I'm I'm a chairman of a small charity, but it's it, it's it's a charity, but it's really a, it's Parachute Regimental Association, a branch mm -hmm. of. They're all they're all charities in their own right, um, and the I didn't set that up obviously. But for those charities that end up quite <laughs> messy, you know, or or they fold, or it's hard to tell the money's gone, or uh, you name it, X, Y, Z, why people will try to get pulled up. I will hedge a bet that 99.9% .9 of the time, what has happened is a charity's been set up. I'm going to try and get, get set up in, with honest intentions. Man, the emotions that go into mm -hmm. that decision to set up a charity to do it is huge, and it is emotions driving it. And if you haven't got, if you if you're not if you don't 
if you're not guided, if you're not guided or haven't got the, the, the awareness or the sort of experience or knowledge to be able to go about forming it in the right way as Scott has done, like sounds to me perfectly, then you end up with setting something up. You've got no experience about business because charity is a flipping business, right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clarify what I'm saying here. Charity is a business. Charity exists to make money, okay? The money is for the beneficiaries. That's it. Charity yeah. exists to make money, but the money is for beneficiaries, okay? Mm -hmm. It's like good, honest intentions. Now, you set that up. You're full of emotions. You set X, Y, Z charity up with whatever with whatever intent. And then, like I said, you've got no idea about business. You can now, let alone how charities work, and it is a flipping nightmare. Yeah. And you've got no idea how to go about raising money properly because... One thing about charities, it is very, very difficult to raise the money you need compared to what an organization is, mm -hmm. a, a company is. A company goes and sells products. It goes and sells products to meet the needs of people to make money. That's yeah. not what a charity does. Yeah. They need people to give them money to support other people beneficiaries. Yeah. Right? It's it's a challenge. And so yeah. that's what I like to think anyway. I think I I think I'm right. I I don't look at it. Like most of these charities got pear shaped or the money doesn't go where it, it's, they should have gone when it's set up. It's it's because peop, the people who set them up, it was done in a sh really short space of time, huge emotions behind it, and they haven't got the experience and the knowledge to be able to run that enterprise. Yeah. And then it goes pear shaped, and 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 I'd be I'm happy with that. If it is most of them, I'm happy with that because do you know what? If you haven't got people with emotional drive behind and doing things like that, you wouldn't have the awesome charities out there exist yeah. now like scotties and like you name it the other yeah big ones out there doing amazing work it just it's just one it's just one of those things right it's one of those things and then you get the point one percent who are absolute <laughs> <laughs> but you know you can be as transparent as you want you're always gonna get someone i'm just warning you you're always gonna get someone or multiple people who are gonna go look at a number and just pull up the charity have a whinge about something yeah. for completely the wrong reasons that's yeah. not me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing. I do. I generally, I generally do. I generally do. It's amazing. It's been amazing to chat to you. Um, have, have, have we, is there anything you want to cover that we haven't covered? No, I don't think so. Sure. Yeah. I feel like I've run on. I hope it's interesting for people. Very interesting. <laughs> but no, honestly, it's uh, it's great to hear about what Scott is doing. It's great to hear that um, you and your family are doing well, obviously. And, um, and, most importantly, that uh, oh, one of the most important things is that uh, it's all been done in in Lee's name, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I love that. And we've got like um, I was really lucky. Well, when we set it up, you know, my brother has been heavily involved, and now is the chief exec. Which again, some people say, oh, brothers and sisters running a charity. It's like, oh, here we go. But I trust him, like you know, and and I got to that point where I was like, I can't run a charity. I have no business skills. I, I'm learning as I go, but I don't know how to do this, how to do that. And Stuart does. And, and that, but he's also got the passion because he's seen what his sister's family have been through. He's lost his brother-in-law. So he gets it as well. And all of our team, it's what I love about the culture at Scott is, is you, we've seen people come in and, you know, no disrespect for them or any, like they're amazing people. But sometimes if the passion's not there and you, and the drive's not there, it doesn't always, it doesn't always fit. So, it's, it is about having the right team in place and the right people that care, but also the the people. Yeah, that's a, that's a bit rubbish. I've no, no, you no, you bang on, and it's one of the challenges that that charities face. It's they really grow. hard. Yeah, the smaller an organisation, the easier it is to maintain a quality of personnel you got behind the organisation. The bigger you grow, the harder it is to maintain that quality. Yeah, very difficult. Exactly. You've got if you if you lose the passion and the personal touch. You know what I was saying about you know the stuff that goes out to the kids is is personal to that one child you know so if you if you as you get bigger like I used to do all that myself and now we've got an amazing like Haley does it all the smart she runs the smiles program and so she sends out all the gifts and makes sure and it's it's hard to step away sometimes and make and be like I don't want to lose that personal touch like our families love the vibe of Scott is they love how it feels but it's also got to be run professionally and the foundations have got to be put in place to make sure this is substantial and will last and um, yeah, but I'm, I'm proud, and I I love the fact that it's in Lee's memory and Lee's name, and like Scotty's little soldiers. Lee was called Scotty in the army. He called Kai's little soldiers. It's kind of a play on the name. The 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 character we've got. My gra my cousin was a graphic designer, so got really lucky <laughs> lucky with my family. But my cousin was a graphic designer, so designed our logo, and like his boots are undone because Lee was a bit his laces are undone in his boots because Lee was a little bit of a messy soldier and. 
<laughs> but he's a corporal. The rank of him is a corporal, which Lee was. And was about, when when Lee's um, when Lee was being repatriated, I'll just tell you this story. But it's not funny, but probably not funny. But um, the my VO said, could you go upstairs and get Lee's belt and beret? And I was like, oh yeah, okay. And I went upstairs and I was like. Oh, I just I was like, holy shit, Lee! Like your belt is stuck together with blue tack. For God's sake, do you know what I mean? It was like, and my I come down. I was like, look at the buckle, and my VA was like, do you want me to sort? I was like, no, no, leave it. Put it on like that. I like put it on the coffee and with blue tacks holding it together. It's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do people? So, what's the website? Um, so the www.scottyslittlesoldiers.co.uk uh, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and we've also got just one more thing before I go, one more little plug. Uh, <laughs> um, so we've got um, a clothing brand as well called Fear Nought. And uh, so it's Fear Nought is the motto of the tank regiment. And so there's still a connection to Lee and everything. And we, um, it's, it's, so it's, it's aimed at veterans, I guess, but it's out there and it sells uh it sells and people don't even realise that they're supporting Scottish Little Soldiers as they buy it, you know. So then when it comes through the post, they get a thing saying, oh, you're, this is, you've now donated to Scottish Little Soldiers. So it's a cool brand and it's another way of just people can support the charity really by buying the Fear Nought stuff. So it's I, didn't know you had, I didn't know about that. I didn't know you? Now. I know now. I'm going to send you a cap so you can wear it. Definitely. Send it around the podcast. Okay. 100%. I will. 100%. Listen, it's been a pleasure. Keep doing what you do. Will do. Thank you. And um, anything I can do in the meantime, in the meantime, in the meantime, what? Anything I can do to support, let me know. Right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.